excited to hear about the um, Solidas project um, in, on solidarity in European societies, empowerment, social justice, and citizenship. So, Marta, please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, I'm starting, okay? Uh, so I'm, um, I'm going to talk briefly with this five minutes highlight that we have about the uh, project that we conducted under, uh, under the framework program Horizon 2020. And um, uh, this it was a research project. I say, I say it was because it finished two years ago. Uh, and it's called Solidus, Solidarity in European Societies social empowerment, social justice and citizenship. And the goal of this uh, project was analyzing actions of solidarity, both grassroots and institutionalized uh, actions, which were emerging out of the economic and the social crisis. So this was before the sanitary crisis that we are uh, living right now uh, uh, worldwide, but it was um, um, analyzing uh, the economic the effects of economic crisis and also the the, um, the social crisis which was all the refugee crisis and so on at the time okay so um the project had two important focuses on the one hand uh, we were analyzing solidarity in europe with social and political impact so we were analyzing actions of solidarity which had uh, improvements created improvements for citizens in society and also uh, what we call inclusive solidarity, which means uh, um, um, actions that do not exclude people, but in, in, uh, instead includes uh, all people, all vulnerable groups, and so on. So this was um, the approach of the project. Um, and for that, it was necessary uh, to implement what we call communicative methodology which is, uh, it's not a participatory approach. It means that we put into dialogue the uh, knowledge that we accumulate from the scientific community, research, knowledge from research, in dialogue with the knowledge from the lived experiences of the social actors. So this, um, uh, through this process, we can co-create knowledge uh, together, which was useful to understand how was solidarity solidarity built in Europe. No? So it was a big, a very big project and we did many case studies throughout, throughout uh, um, all over Europe and with this focus on uh, um, solidarity that was inclusive and created impact, uh, uh, improving the lives of citizens in different parts of Europe. Yeah? So we did many interviews, focus groups, and also a survey that we'll, I will also briefly comment about because it also has uh, uh, implications for what we are talking here about. No? And that's one example of one of the many issues uh, um, that we uh, analyze. It was, uh, this was one uh, action that we analyzed in Spain, the platform of mortgage victims. Why we focus on that? because there was evidence through the, research of, uh, through the research of the social and political impacts because they were able to stop uh, um, um, house, house evictions, to create housing for many people, to create a new legislation for people without homes and so on out of the economic uh, crisis. So they were very successful, but without the co-creation of knowledge, it would have been impossible to know this impact and how the people were, uh, uh, were benefiting from this action. So out of that, we could analyze what makes an organization, a citizen's organization, successful in improving people's lives. And we found things like internal democracy, level of plurality, level of transparency, comparing many initiatives throughout Europe. No? I cannot go into depth into this, no, but, but uh, this process, and, and the same we did with the platform against mortgage victims in Spain, with many different initiatives of many different kinds of topics throughout Europe, is what uh, um, made us found the components that favor this type of inclusive solidarity in Europe. And um, the, another important thing is that we did a survey of transnational solidarity, and one part of the survey is what we call scientifically informed solidarity. This is, uh, so what we did is we ask a question, for instance, one question is whether uh, citizens will be, uh, so we ask, uh, people, no, would you be um, uh, happy to, uh, to um, give free health care for everybody, including undocumented migrants? 
Hmm? So, and later in the questionnaire, we tell them, we gave them information from research of how the benefits of giving universal health care, including for undocumented migrants, no? And the people uh, who responded no, uh, like it, there was a, ch a significant change on those who changed their uh, their opinion when they had information from uh, scientific information. No, so this is what we call scientifically informed solidarity, and that is why citizens in dialogue uh, with science they can uh, benefit very much from uh, um, uh, our society can benefit very much from this dialogue. And finishing uh, here, and just that we are now doing a project of interact that focusing on, um, precisely on these topics of informed uh, solidarity. Thank you. Finishing here, five minutes. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Uh, well done, keeping the time. Thanks, Marta, so much. <laughs> Really fascinating, and I uh, I love this topic on solidarity. I think that's uh, very important, and I'm really too happy to open the floor if there are any questions in the chat. So we are 55 people in the chat, um, so please um, go ahead and ask your questions now. So James is entering, hopefully. So, Marta, if there aren't any questions um, from the audience, um, I would really be interested on your uh, now with all the lessons that you learned um, going to progress with your project. Okay, with uh, All Interact project, is in, uh, we have just started now this month, October, and uh, it's under um, uh, Science Without for Society uh, uh, program. And uh, the focus uh, is, uh, is focusing on two uh, SDGs, on uh, education and gender. And the focus is how to um, uh, provide no, in this uh, participation of citizens in providing and sharing um, knowledge, evidence from uh, sci science on these two topics. So kind of... Um, uh, there are many things that are like uh, people just talk about without any scientific basis, as is helping citizens in a platform, there will be a platform, an app created uh, through that, in which citizens can interact with scientists in order to find out what is scientific and what is not about these two uh, particular uh, SDGs. Really fascinating. Um, so Norbert suggested in the chat that we could collect questions and ask them later on. And um, if everybody's happy with that, I'm really, um, really uh, eager to follow that idea. Um, so let's do that. We have our lightning talks, and in the end, we will have um, a bit longer Q&A round. So um, with that, um, I would suggest that we try whether Stavos uh, is now working. Shall we give it a try? Stavros, would you like to try Please. out? Is he gone? He's coming. <laughs> there you are. So would you like to share? You would you like to try to share your screen? We can good? see it. Yes. It's looking good. Yes, I did. And we can hear you. So um very happy to give you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, excellent sound, at least here in Berlin. We've been experiencing that the sound in Berlin sometimes seems yeah, different yeah. than <laughs> other places. You can hear yes, excellent. Him. So, Stavos, the floor is yours. Hmm. Me. Stavos, you're frozen again. Okay, I would suggest for the last yeah. presentation that you come back on the floor and we would give the next speaker the chance to speak. What is it, uh, Remy? Yes, so, uh, so Stavos, uh, maybe we try to shift you to the very end so that we can try to solve your problems um, in the background and uh, we would now like to invite Remy on the floor. And uh, Remy, Kim is going to share your presentation. Um, so I think Kim is getting ready to share it right now. Um. Uh, 
I, I send my presentation. It is recorded already to avoid oh, uh, this oh, problem. Oh, yeah, I can't. Better. Okay. I can't share here anymore. Oh, wait, I have to come to you first. And then we have two slots ready still, so that's fine. I mute myself here on my computer and I can share now your presentation. Um, but we can't hear it. Digital nervous system of our planet. What happened in our physical world create a digital footprint on the internet. If now there is a failed earthquake in California, go on Twitter Let and you will see, oh my God, right. earthquake. Okay. <laughs> Today, internet acts as the digital nervous system of our planet. What happened in our physical world create a digital footprint on the internet. If now there is a failed earthquake in California, go on Twitter and you will see, oh my God, earthquake. So if you want to detect failed earthquakes in California, just count the number of tweets containing the keyword earthquake. That's what we do on the top left. It works very well in California and you get detections faster than seismic location. It doesn't work in many places because Twitter is not that popular and it has strong limitations because of the poor geographical information on Twitter. What we have been doing at the Euromed Seismological Center is just to monitor the traffic on our website. So EMSC is one of the top global earthquake information center in the world. And if people, eyewitnesses following a tremor, make a Google search, a number of them will hit our website and you see a dramatic surge of traffic. You just, you then just have to look at the IP addresses to know where and when an earthquake is felt. But the most impressive approach is to use our app. So last week, uh, we have 1.4 million users. And what we observe is that when people feel a tremor, or users feel a tremor, they open the app within a dozen of seconds. And in this case, you get a very accurate geographical information. So, Basically, with the app, people become real-time tremor sensors. This is an earthquake between Iran and Iraq. When you see the orange dots, that's people opening the app, the propagating circles being the seismic wave. So you see that it mimics the seismic wave propagation. So people are real-time sensors. And when you see all these purple dots, that's people opening the app after a notification. So what do we do with all these ways to detect earthquakes, what we call crowdsource detection? We identified felt earthquakes. Felt earthquakes are no more than 10% of the earthquakes we are able to locate, but they are the only one who actually matters for the public. So on the app, on the, on the left, you see we only report felt earthquakes with a very simple color code about the expected effect. We then ask eyewitnesses to share their geolocated pictures and through a set of cartoons, the level of shaking of the level of damage they have, uh, they have been through. So we call these felt reports. We collect these felt reports at, a, at an incredible pace. You can have 2000 felt reports within four minutes of the earthquake. So it works great. It works great, but there are some limitations. Because the majority of people are not going to install an app of an earthquake app before an earthquake, the number of users typically increases after the main shock. So every time there is a felt earthquake, it increases, but after it tends to decrease. So the app doesn't work, it works better for aftershocks than for main shock, which is an issue. The second issue is that when you have some severe damage, people, the priority of the people is to put themselves in priority. So in this case, what we observe, we crowdsource a lot of information at longer distances, but we have a lack of information in the damage area. We want to fill this gap and we believe citizen seismology is the key for this. 
What we have been doing, for example, is to contribute to a project which, where we set up a citizen-operated network in Haiti. This is, these are the red uh, points. So these are citizen uh, sensors, which cost 300 euros, and people host them, and we generate rapid earthquake information with it. What we also want to do is to create a community through a forum in different actions and citizen uh, uh, science activities. We, we have different type of users, and there is one of them which is of specific interest is diaspora. When there is a damaging earthquake, every people, everybody who is emotionally connected with the country is looking to know what's going on for my loved ones. And we are creating a WhatsApp channel to try to collect this information collected by the diaspora. So just to finalize, we already have a system which, um, which collates information from eyewitnesses and from seismic networks, which works very well, but it has some limitation. And we believe that citizen science can help uh, filling the gaps and uh, contribute to uh, the SDG goal number 11, which is to reduce the adverse effects of natural disaster. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. Oh. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks, uh, thanks, Remy, for that uh, excellent talk. Um, I was super impressed, super impressed by the number of users that you have in the app. Uh, that's absolutely mind blowing. And um, I'm really happy uh, that we later have some time to discuss your talk. And hopefully, everybody um, has some time to gather questions so that we have a great Q&A later on. Um, so having said that, I would like to now invite Johan as next speaker to the floor. And um, Stavros, I hope you don't mind. We're going to sh keep you and shift you to the very end. Um, so hopefully okay. that then your okay. connection is going to be better um, and uh, you have a great talk in the end. So Johan, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. You're ready. Very, very good. So. Um, Johan, I would like to give the floor to you. You're going to talk on land users and land watchers. Um, so um, please start your talk. Yes, hello. Uh, I come from the Soil Conservation Service of Iceland. Uh, the general public has limited possibilities to be involved in scientific and modern work on Icelandic terrestrial ecosystems. Although we have projects who uh, have a land reclamation part of it, there is no scientific or monitoring work that is required on behalf of these participants. In fact, until recently, the monitoring of Icelandic terrestrial ecosystems has mostly been non-existing, despite the fact that these ecosystems are used as rangelands for sea farmers. To, due to the shortage of knowledge and as a measure to resolve conflicts on land use, the project Growland was established in 2017, and it's a cooperative project between different stakeholders. The main aim of, the pro of this project is to establish a long-term monitoring program of these ecosystems and construct indicators for sustainable land use. Our methods are based upon ecosystem functions, and we use both ground measurements such as regular measurements uh, and citizen science, as well as remote sensing. The citizen science project within Growland is named Land Users, Land Watchers. And as the name indicates, the focus is on in engaging land users in monitoring. However, that does not exclude others, such as landowners without livestock, travel association, and other interested groups or people. Uh, the methodology is still in development phase, and the plan is to construct a test group of sea farmers in the summer of 2021. This test group is, will be given access to a special app where all the measurements will be stored, and the aim of this test group is to evaluate the function of the app as well as the practicability of the measurements. The proposed methodology is as follows. Uh, the more pa participants choose the monitoring sites However, they have to be in a homogeneous ecosystems, so it's detectable by remote sensing. Growland provides the participants an iron post to identify the spot for easier return and work in the future. Next to the uh, post, 
the participants take four photographs, one in each of the cardinal directions, as well as in the 25 meters radius from the post, him or her evaluates the soil erosion, its type and severity, as well as the frequency of flowering herbs and grasses to determine the grazing intensity and productivity of the ecosystem. Finally, the participants walk 25 steps in each of the cardinal directions and indicates on what type of vegetation they step on. Uh, these vegetation types are bare ground, mosses and lichens, grasses and grass-like species, forbs, shrublet, shrubs and trees. Uh, the app works offline, and, but it sends the information collected into our database upon connection to Wi-Fi or mobile data. This data, this data is then used alongside with other measurements and remotely sensed data to, esti to estimate the land condition in Iceland. As soon as the partic participant sends the data, an auto-generated report is sent back to him or her where all the measurements are listed and put in context to the previous year's measurements. In the future, comparison to other similar areas around the country and results from other par participants will be shown as well in the report. We plan this project will also increase awareness on sustainable land use and land literacy. Uh, at last, we have presented the citizen science project all over the country and we have found a high level of interest amongst land users and other nature enthusiasts. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. Um, that was really fascinating and I think it's actually a really important um, topic. Um, so I'm really happy that we have some time later on in our Q&A um, to discuss your talk. And um, now I would like to welcome Thorsten from Bremen, uh, who almost could have come to Berlin, um, but unfortunately in the end, uh, due to the corona situation, it didn't work out. Um, so very happy to have you here online, Thorsten. He's going to talk about beekeepers, makers, and eco-hackers, the outreach of citizen Bob, and a deep, do-it-yourself sensor kit. Um, so, Thorsten, welcome uh, to Berlin, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Silke. Can you see my screen, and can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So, that's good. Um, I will try to be shorter than five minutes, faster than five minutes. I would like to talk about the project Bee Observer Bob. And actually, I'm not going to talk about the project itself rather than about a number of interesting side effects facts we experienced. So the Bee Observer project was basically about um, the simple idea of putting a sensor kit in beehives, honey beehives, um, and to monitor the behavior of the bees um, with two basic aims. Uh, one is to enable minimally invasive beekeeping on the one hand. So this, this is a part of uh, food production. And um, the second aim was to provide a data set for like research purposes. Um, and uh, we also added a, a smartphone app and um, like the sensor kit was a DIY kit with manuals and a parts list. So everyone can, could participate um, without being part of the project, just uh, with an internet connection, it was possible. And we tried to establish like uh, many of these sensor beehives all over Germany and it worked incredibly well. Uh, and we published a number of decent papers um, on bees and beekeeping and uh, like uh, methods of artificial in intelligence and machine learning on these data. But the first thing that happened was um, beyond our control was the question of power supply. So uh, in the beginning, we decided we're not going to bother ourselves with power supply. So participants should have a wall socket, some kind of electricity nearby the beehives. Um, and um, the truth is many of the beehives are in places where there's no electricity. 
So the beekeepers started by themselves without uh, any help to invent power supply solutions. They used uh, old car batteries um, with solar panels and tiny wind power solutions, which was um, incredible. So I was fascinated by the creativity to power the Bee Observer uh, sensor kit. Another misuse of the application and the, the Bee Observer sensor kit, kit was done by a project called SMILE, um, which is basically um, an educative project for um, girls at the school age and to teach uh, topics from the computer science area in order to increase the number of um, female students, female informatics students at universities. And they used the sensor kit as part of their didactic programs. So this was also beyond our control. Another thing was um, urban beekeeping in Bremen. So there are a number of urban beekeeping cooperatives. And they are kind of best practice examples for a non-capitalist uh, um, sharing economy new ideas um, and they use the bee observer application to coordinate their beekeeping to manage their beekeeping uh, which is decentralized there is no owner there is no leader so it's the swarm of beekeepers um, that does the beekeeping activities and many of these cooperatives are in low income districts. So it does have an impact on um, the question of uh, like poverty in these districts. And one of the, the um, groups I like most, uh, which uses the Bee Observer Sensor Kit, is a Muslim woman beekeeping group in, uh, in one district in Bremen uh, who sell their own honey and, and uh, bee products. So this is a kind of a misuse of the Bee Observer kit, uh, sensor kit, which I like very much. Um, and then we did all our research um, with citizens. So the, the sensor kit was developed by, by the citizens themselves. And this feeds back to science, to academic science. So the, the Bee Observer sensor kit is now part of a university project for varroa mite control, like parasites, bee parasites. Um, this is not citizen science at all, but um, the main, uh, the core component uh, is derived from the citizen science for project Bee Observer. Um, the citizen science Bee Observer kit is also used in Cameroon. So um, uh, at a university, at a bee research unit, uh, at the university in Cameroon and I'm running out of time so this is the last slide uh, I'm going to show um, we were invited to um, universities in Siberia to talk about citizen science and we met a number of very smart people there at the universities but um, what we also did is um, like our main expertise we talked to the beekeeping groups there and um, it was very interesting to find out how they would use the Bee Observer Sensor Kit. But finally, we, we um, the discussion resulted in the idea of using the Bee Observer Sensor Kit without bees, um, because most of the people there um, would like to tackle the climate change topic because they live on permafrost so many things rely on permafrost there and so we are going to use the the bee observer sensor kit there without bees um, in a citizen science approach um, to put it in the permafrost and see what happens how it reacts to the to the global warming so i was uh, i wasn't faster so i'm sorry um, thank you very much for your attention attention you so much um i think we are all in time for now we have practiced everything you know uh, i think it will go smoothly and so that i will go on now with the next um talk which i have to peek into here because i would like to um introduce norbert steinhaus 
Um, he's going to talk about citizen-enhanced climate actions, a pan-European perspective, and I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Excuse me, I have to get in first. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. And I think uh, to share um, the slides, we are so many people, one could be so kind to leave um, the session just from the speakers now and just listen as a participant. So um, we have the slot free for I can you. Thank you. Okay. Now you're able to share, I think. Yes. Perfect. Find my presentation first. Okay. No, this is not the right one. Where's my Where's my PowerPoint? But the only one who knows. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So there's. It's it's open, but I can't see it in the in the window to share. So that's a bit strange. I'm I'm sorry wow. for that. So now there it is. Uh, okay. I, I found it. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> So, uh, my presentation is called Citizen Enhanced Climate Actions, uh, giving a pan-European perspective. And um, it's about an ongoing project, which is uh, about midterm, a Horizon 2020 project in uh, the, the call for territorial responsible research and innovation. So that's also the first um, letters in the acronym. It's about fostering innovative climate action. And um, the basic assumption when, uh, getting into the planning for, for the proposal is that there is no lack of information about climate change. Uh, of course, there are a lot of discussions going on. There are conflicts. Uh, we always are aware of different opinions, uh, different uh, interpretations of data, but reliable information is available uh, for all level of stakeholders who want to get this information. But what is lacking is practice to tackle climate change. And uh, therefore, we uh, thought that when um, we, we set up this project, we, we have to think about different regions. Um, and we identified six pilot regions. They all have uh, different, um, have to live with different climate impacts. Um, but the idea behind is we have to go to the regional level instead of discussing global issues. Um, so our partners are coming from Spain, France, from Germany, from Poland, Belarus, and uh, from Serbia. And Serbia, you, you see the bigger, bigger color around the country, is also reaching out to Southeast European countries with uh, the findings and the activities around Terrifica. So what do we want to do? Um, first of all, starting from uh, from the assumption, or not for the assumption, for um, from from the the I don't know, from the statement that citizen participation matters in climate change adap adaptation. We want to involve citizens in agenda setting processes uh, corresponding to the challenges they identify on the local or on the regional level. And from after the identification process, we want uh, the local partners to develop climate change adaptation plans directly on the issues they identified in their uh, personal environment. Of course, uh, not just plans, but also put them into practice. So um, um, the developed plans and activities will be tested and evaluated, um, focused as I said, on mitigation and adaptation to climate change issues. And the evaluation aspect, what we do in Terrifica, will be also uh, presented in an afternoon session today by Alexander Gaber. Um, okay, what we do, uh, we want, want to uh, put the know-how and um, the, the experience of local people um, to give scientific insights a face. We developed um, a crowd mapping tool um in all involved regions uh, we have seven local versions for spain we have um, spanish and catalyst uh, catalan and um, in on this map people can put a mark on different issues um 
related to climate change. Might be heat, might be flooding, might be drought, might be air pollution. And they can either identify positive or negative experiences on these maps. The idea behind is to invite people who leave their mark on the map to directly develop solutions in a broader stakeholder group uh, for these specific identified uh, um, topics and hotspots. What we did so far, as I said, we are midterm and we have probably one and a half or even two years um, ahead of us. Of course, we are facing problems with COVID-19 because a lot of activities were planned face to face. But we established local co-creation teams, ran seminars, um, reflective workshops with all um, co-creation teams from all countries. We offer customized training for all involved stakeholders field trips um, to these marked places and hotspots with best practice or to, to see uh, what, what is the concrete issue uh, marked on the map. Of course, we develop the crowd mapping tool. Um, and of course, we go into dissemination and find synergies with other EU projects based on responsible research and innovation. And I'm very happy to be at this conference because I learned a lot about other projects working on similar issues um, so that we definitely afterwards will get into contact and to think about how to share the data we collected and how to make use of the data they collected. Uh, in the next step with, with the data and of course reaching out to, to different audiences um, in all participating countries, we will have organized summer schools with participants from each pilot region in tandems of uh, students and citizens to develop climate adaptation scenarios which correspond to their competences and especially to the local findings um, bring them together in a in a final conference and um, try to develop a vision of a climate landscape 2030 which we then will publish as a result of the summer schools and hopefully feed into the future political discussion on climate change adaptation. So we definitely want a positive future vision of the cities uh, regarding the challenges they face. So when exploring possibilities, at least one finding is, you know, if you go into public participation, in the pro process of problem identification in the in the under the aspects of data provision and creating solutions this definitely has to be done uh, by public inclusion in the implementation of the activities so not just collecting data but involving those who are engaged who are concerned also into the innovative activities uh, and on problem solving what we already found out and <laughs> Uh, is that this kind of bottom-up climate actions are not utopian. They, they work, people are engaged, and I'm happy to, to share further information with you after this. And of course, my favorite um, quote from Frank Zappa, a mind is like a parachute, it doesn't work if it's not open. So please think beyond the box and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you also very much for your interesting talk. I think also what you said that yeah, we should connect in the citizen science community and I can see in the chat even that, yeah, we have to interconnect here and do things together. It's all about and I'm very happy that we actually at the conference can facilitate that um, networking. Um, we go on uh, because we still have two talks here and that's why I would like to invite uh, Julia to share, and she did already perfect, uh, share her talk on the consumer footprint calculator. Uh, I'm very excited to use it too. I have not done it. It would be very interesting to hear more about it. Welcome, Julia. Uh, thank you. And good morning, everyone. Um, today, we are all witnessing the impact on the environment resulting from our lifestyles. Let's think about the disasters that are happening today all around the globe. Forest fires, extreme weather events like floods, environmental pollution, marine litter, biodiversity loss, and so on. And it's up to us to change such effects. 
And a change is really possible. Resulting from COVID-19, we'll all, we'll all have experienced changes in our lifestyles during and after the lockdown. We can change the, the way we travel, um, uh, with, uh, reducing flights and increasing local tourism. We can reduce direct emissions. We can enhance local consumption, particularly in the food sector. So changing our habits to our sustainable lifestyle is possible. But how can we make it happen? And more important, how can we empower citizens to our more sustainable lifestyles? We can raise people awareness. We can provide clear messages on sustainable choices. Also to avoid confusion due to environmental information present in the market. We can outline available choices and action. And we can empower people by better understanding the impact of their individual choices. And such pathways would lead to an active engaging with people, which is key in starting behavioral changes towards more sustainable lifestyles, such as fostering SDGs achievement. And different levels of engagement can be supported, and it should be up to each person to decide how much they want to engage. And in this context, we would like to present you a tool that the Joint Research Center has developed to increase the awareness of citizens on their individual lifestyles. It's the Consumer Footprint Calculator. It allows you to calculate the environmental impacts of your consumption habits, as well as evaluate how changes in your lifestyles may improve your personal footprint. The starting point is uh, SDG 12 on sustainable production and consumption, but there are several impacts on many other SDGs. And the calculator is based on a life cycle approach. This means that it considers the impacts occurring along the entire life cycle of the product and the energy consumed. It is based on five areas of consumption, food, mobility, appliances, household goods, and housing and calculates the impact on 16 environmental categories. And the user can calculate uh, their impacts in different ways, for example, against planetary boundaries, uh, by era consumption, or compared with the average EU citizen. And we are looking now for an entire toolbox to better support citizens in the green transition. Apart from the awareness of the goals uh, and calculation of impacts, uh, we see the need to link the calculator with citizen science. We see great opportunities in the collection of microdata, engaging citizens in the scientific process that is pivotal to define improved behavior-oriented policies. And this might be done by offering different possibilities. Uh, we are currently working on future developments of the tool, for example, considering uh, the impact uh, um, of consumption on other SDGs, uh, or also a system that allows citizens to track changes in their lifestyles, and also to provide insight and practical tips uh, to change, uh, and uh, small daily actions, and, and many more. And always uh, in a process of co-creation and co-design uh, with citizens. And this is a challenge in this uh, COVID-19 time. We had, uh, we had uh, also planned a co-design activity during the festival, but at the end it was not possible to carry it out. And now we are looking for a solution to engage more the citizens in the process. And if you have any suggestion on it, uh, you're welcome. We are pleased to talk about it uh, in, uh, in, the, in a further discussion. Thanks. Um, if you're interested in more information about the consumer footprint calculator, here, here there is the link. And um, it will be soon available also in our platform, No SDGs, where you can find also other tools uh, on uh, the sustainable development goals. Thanks. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, I learned. <laughs> and I, what I would like to focus also on or mention is really that it's so important and nowadays that we do something with behavioral change and really empower citizens that their action actually has an impact on the SDGs. Um, 
we go on because we just have a few minutes left and I really hope Stavros everything is gonna work out fine yeah, so I, um, turned off I will try yeah I will try to I turned off my screen and I can try to share also the, the slides and if it doesn't work so you can uh, probably you can show yourself Stav the Stavros, we, we are going to try it the way that we now <laughs> I think it's better Kim is going to share your slides and uh, you just have your camera on an audio. I, I, I so don't put my just... camera, I just put my audio. It's okay? Yes, excellent. I think that's the excellent. way to go. Yes, Kim has your presentation ready for you. We're yeah, really you. excited now. We've been waiting for such a long time. Thank you. So, Welcome. yeah. So, as I said uh, many times before, uh, it will be, it is uh, a citizen science program around large research infrastructures. For instance, the European Gravitation Observatory here in Pisa, a deep sea uh, neutrino observatory outside Italy and outside France, CERN, that everybody knows, and also using the cosmic rays. Can you show the next slide, please? Now, the goals, can you show the next slide? And can, so, you, can you? Oh my see? goodness! Yeah, Kim, Kim has so many. Kim has so many windows open in her computer because she's the technical mastermind okay. here. So okay, the goals are: first of all, I mean, I will try to convince you that uh, doing fundamental science implies also to have an environmental concern. In my next slides, so it is an interdisciplinary scientific knowledge we are promoting. Then, since these days, we're not looking at the universe only through light, but also through many other messengers, as we call them, multi-messenger. We go beyond the views, visual, and you'll see that we develop sonification techniques, for instance. That permits us also, of course, inclusion and diversity, for instance, extend participation to visually impaired. And when one does uh, science trying to, to be in a two-way process, then one is forced to, to increase critical thinking, effectively separate, in our case, signal from background, formulate hypotheses, estimate one's own biases, manage uncertainty, and collecting thinking versus hard thinking, try to, to have collective uh, approaches. Then, last but not least, also we have uh, done a few actions uh, between art and science. So, let, next slide, please. Next slide. So, just an image, uh, just to explain to you why there is this uh, this crosstalk between fundamental science and uh, and uh, and uh, environmental control. So we know from Einstein that violent phenomena in the universe, merging of black holes, of neutron stars, and things like that, produce deformations of space we call gravitational waves, and they manifest themselves on the Earth as a, as a minute difference between two masses at three kilometers each in our it is at three to four kilometers our interferometers of two masses which in our jargon are in free fall so you understand already that the thing that we have to do is to isolate this signal from every environmental impact seismicity uh, the passage of uh, the passage of uh, uh, of uh, clouds anthropogenic noise all this can create electromagnetic events. All, all this can create noise. So we have to understand the surrounding uh, environment before we understand the universe. Second thing, if you click, the second particularity of these signals, if you click again uh, in the slide, please. These deformations are in the acoustic bandwidth. They are, they are not sound themselves, but they are in the, the signal is in the acoustic bandwidth. So we are already, if you wish, in the acoustic uh, uh, domain. And what happened, of course, this was a discovery that happened five years ago. The first discovery uh, gave the Nobel Prize in 2017. So it is advanced science, but has also environmental uh, uh, impact. Next slide, click twice, click once and twice, because that was the first Nobel, and there you go. And this is what I already said, that our infrastructures are embedded in the, in the environment. 
So the citizen science task is to classify and characterize the signals and noise depending on the point of view, environmental or cosmic, if you wish, universe, uh, for searching for the universe. Next slide, please. The same thing happens when you use more uh, uh, messengers. We will look at the universe not only, as I said, with light, but we look at it also with gravitational waves, neutrinos, and cosmic rays. So click twice, please. Yes. And for instance, we have at the bottom of the sea, uh, we try to detect neutrinos, and this, the noise, if you wish, the background against which we have to, to see these neutrinos coming from the cosmos is A, bioluminescence, B, the acoustic signals from uh, whales, from dolphins, and things like that. We have 15 years of data on this. Things that are happening at 3,000 meters below uh, the surface of the sea that nobody has really studied in detail. Again, this we give, we try with the citizens to make them work. Next slide. Last but not least, on the environmental logic, it is we use cosmic rays to see what happens at the interior of the volcanoes, to do archaeology, to look inside the infrastructure, because the muons can give a radiography of a hidden structure. And so this, again, it is detectors that we will distribute in schools and everywhere, and we hope that they will participate in this uh, thing. It can also be sensitive to changes of, for instance, nebulosity, of uh, many other things of the atmosphere. So next slide. So all this, uh, we use two main uh, tools to that. I skip methodology, which is more or less standard, including a policy roadmap at the end. Uh, we use a, a common platform. All of this we implement in a common platform called Zoo Universe that is uh, by University of Oxford, well known, has more than a million volunteers, called zoouniverse.org, and the new sonification software, Sonouno, that, as I said, we try to sonify and to give our data, not only at, as a visual, but also as, uh, also as sonic. Next slide, please. And I'm finishing. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is the implementation in the platform Zooniverse. Unfortunately, all this will be completely public only at the end of the month. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, and the important tool I said, no, no, the previous one, please. Previous one, not this one, yeah. Very important, we have, for, we collaborate, I don't know if you know, but we collaborate with a very well-known blind astronomer, Wanda Merced Diaz, and also a colleague of us from Argentina, Beatriz Garcia, and there, <clears throat> With their help, we developed this software, if you wish, where we consider the sonic representation of the data, not only as a sort of instrument to increment uh, inclusion, but also increment the way we understand also the perception we have in, in fundamental science of how we will separate uh, signal from background, not only in the visual part, but also in the sonic part. So both, if you wish, an epistemological way of addressing us trying at the same time to, inc to increase inclusion. Next slide. We also do a lot of things which I will not have the time to talk about on art and science. We made a, a quite successful art and science exhibition, very high names of art. And we are in relationship with uh, the program by Sol Perlmutter, Nobel Prize on sense and sensibility in science, where we try to develop based on all that critical thinking. So in the last slide, if you wish, uh, it is essentially what I just said. No, no, the, the, the next slide is essentially what I said. Uh, I, I, the, I mean, a, a slogan we use is, uh, uh, you know, for the ancients, the word cosmos was good order and good order, good, good order not, not only concerned the universe, but also the earth, society, and the human. So I think I've, uh, you know, I've touched upon all these issues saying that uh, we hope that our program exactly tries to mix these four areas and try to see how we embed, we are embedded them as humans uh, in the cosmos. Then the last slide, the absolutely last slide, this is why we said, at the, not the, the next one, this is why we said that we think that we are relevant both to four, five, 13, 14, 15, and 17. And thank you for your passions.
Thank you for your patience. And uh, I think uh, it was worth waiting for your talk. So that was really fascinating. And I think uh, now we would like to open the Q&A round. Um, so please go ahead and ask your questions. like to go to the guided tours because it's already 12.30. We need to go now. Otherwise, since it's a break, we can also have a few minutes at, for a Q&A if you like to for the rest of the audience. Um, I had uh, some questions here. Is it okay with the... Um, I go out here, I believe. I think that is better now, exactly. I'm sorry, I was not prepared for this one here. Um, okay, I have some questions from the audience. Um, first of all, back to Torsten. Um, Julia, even you could ask it yourself. Uh, what kind of data is being obtained through the session in the beehives? Um, could you give some more insights, please? I can. Um, I suppose I can. So the, the kind of data we obtain are uh, like a modular system of sensors. Now we have temper a temperature array, uh, we have microphones, we have uh, humidity sensors, um, and a camera that um, does a lot of uh, um, analysis on the on the computer itself. So it, it counts incoming and outgoing bees and it tries to detect uh, what the bees bring in the hive. But um, the single data, the single sensor channel can be interesting from a biological perspective. Um, but the sensors, sensors themselves are kind of trivial. So the, the interesting thing happens when we uh, do the sense of fusion thing like machine learning combining uh, the channels to get a broader picture of what what happens inside the hive the next question is also for you actually um and suits very well naomi says i really much enjoyed the beekeeping projects i'm curious to whether you know what the participants learned by participating in the beekeeping project So I, I try to give a short answer in the chat already. Um, the Bee Observer project was uh, a, um, so last, uh, yesterday I heard the word, the, the, the term extreme citizen science. And I think that the Bee Observer project was extreme citizen science at its best. So, so the participants were involved at every stage of the pro process we we went to the beekeeping groups at the beginning and uh, try to create hypothesis what do they want to know from the bees what do they want to know about beekeeping um, the citizens developed the technology the sensor kit um, they parts of the citizens were involved in the coding and the programming of of the application of uh, all that is available now. Um, we have a group, a citizen group that does um, like uh, uh, use methods of machine learning, methods of artificial intelligence on the data. So um, there is a way, I, I think many of them learned a lot about uh, computer science at, at this aspect. They're, they also learned a lot about bees and beekeeping. And um, extreme, be, uh, extreme citizen science means uh, that we also published the papers with the citizens. So, so many of the citizens, some of the citizens participate in writing the papers with us. So they learned a lot. Um, they learned a lot about bees. We learned a lot about bees and the ecosystems. And what I learned was um, that, so one challenge for me was, to give it away, uh, to not to have control. And what I learned is um, that 
you don't have to be afraid of giving it away because something wonderful will return. And this is what I wanted to show that many things returned that I didn't expect. And, and that was great. <laughs> and that wasn't my, my responsibility. So it, it just happened, yeah, happened. it came from the community. Also for Zilke, I think we in our project have also the same. And I believe many of you peers here have the same um, feeling about when you work together with citizen scientists. I think it's uh, in both ways a lot to uh, give. Um, we go on. Um, I have another question for the Terrifica projects um towards oh it's going away uh is there any future project planned within this region um of course we will have to ask um, our partner from serbia the center for promotion of science and i'm i'm happy to connect if it's really just focusing on um, um southeastern europe uh, European countries. Um, I'm, I'm, hap I'm happy to, to share the information to the, the contact details. I, I think um, our partner was at least for a short time in. I can't, don't know if he's still in. Um, of course, we are thinking about continuing the work of Terrifica in the Green Deal call, but we are still in the in the phase of, you know, uh, shaping ideas and brainstorming. But uh, would be happy to exchange uh, on um, possible. Uh, cooperation. Also, one last question for you yeah. here. Um, eventually, did you consider to use this data in climate advocacy actions or even uh, litigation? Yeah, so I, I had to check the last term as well, <laughs> which means in jurisdiction, in trials, in uh, going to court. And I think the data we collect. Are you? Now we can hear you again. Okay, so uh, I had to uh, had to check the last term as well, which means uh, using it in uh, legislative, in, in trial, in court, in in any legal uh, <laughs> illegal issues. But I think the data we collect uh, is not sound enough for using it in um, le for legal issues, but definitely for advocacy. And uh, in our stakeholder groups, we also have uh, decision makers from the regions, at least partly, and therefore uh, advocacy starts from the very beginning uh, by also involving uh, those who can make decisions later on. Thank you so yeah, much for your answer. I think since we are 11 minutes behind the time, uh, but I thought we are so many here so i think we couldn't continue and i would first point out thank you so much for all your great talks here i think i would leave it open if someone really likes still to, to connect it's like an internal unofficial meet the expert we could do it um but uh, Zilke would like to mention some final words but from my side thank you so much for listening and for giving your presentations Yes, uh, also big thanks from my side. Um, that was really inspiring and um, I really loved the spirit of um, connecting also between projects and um, that we should share knowledge in Europe and uh, make the best of um, the knowledge that we have and expand on it. Um, I would like to take the chance to mention again how important the declaration that we have developed on a bottom-up process during uh, the preparation of the conference um, is for everybody here in um, the audience. It's a declaration from the community towards policymakers, and we should really uh, use it and please make your voice heard by signing the declaration. The declaration uh, will be handed over to policymakers. It's going towards the European Union um, to provide more and better funding for citizen science towards the SDGs. And a second remark, uh, please also use the evaluation form that the evaluation team is um, again and again posting in the chats um, because the evaluation, as most of you know, is part of the conference and we really appreciate your feedback. And with this, um, big thanks again to everyone listening and um, the great speakers. And I hope that you now have a good time uh, in the room that Kim is going to leave open for you and um, enjoy the rest of the conference and have 
now a great e-poster session and um, enjoy also all the great festival booths that you will find in the festival area. And thanks so much for all of your attention and your patience for technical failures that we are facing sometimes and um, hope to see you in another session this afternoon. Much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thorsten, uh, will, will you stay here? Yeah, they need to interconnect here. I saw that. <laughs> um, I, I will go to, go to our booth, uh, Norbert. Okay. okay. Oh. Uh, but but you, uh, oh, yes, come to our yeah. booth. There are also others, others from the Bee Observer project, and uh, we can talk uh, more, more about it. Okay, fine. Yeah, good. Then, I... then everyone, please enjoy uh, the festival and the e-posters. There are many, many uh, interesting and projects awaiting and discuss everything in detail with you there. Thank you for chairing the session. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Great job. <laughs> okay. okay, see you then. Thank you.